Well, welcome, everyone. Um, this, uh, this is a panel discussion, so we're going to try and keep it as interactive as possible. Um, it's better for us and better for you guys if, um, yeah, if, if you ask us stuff and, and we kind of bounce off you as well, rather than just doing a monologue between the four of us. Um, just before we get started and do introductions, um, just to kind of gauge the audience a bit, can you put your hands up if you run machine learning workloads on Kubernetes? Okay, so yeah, good, good chunk of the audience. People online, that was like 60% of the audience. Um, okay, and then of those people, how many of you are running stuff in production? Okay, probably most of them as well, so that's good. So like half the room are running production ML workloads on Kube. Um, and I think that's probably easy. That gives us an idea, right, where to start. I'm curious, of the people that raise their hand, are you guys also training models? So raise your hands also. Well, wow, running on production, managing the infrastructure, and training the models. OK, cool. Cool. Right, um, so like, what we'll do is we'll, we'll kick off with like a quick introduction to each of us um, and maybe a little bit about like what machine learning looks like in your organization. So usually, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, thank you. My name is Yudre. Um, I'm the team lead of data science around time from Bloomberg. Uh, so we provide on-prem uh, biometal node-based machine learning infrastructure. We provide multiple uh, products through our platform, including like notebook um, training, model serving, Spark Extra. Um, and we have many very interesting internal use cases, uh, such as machine learning for financial product, for our news product, and extra. So um, I'm Ed, uh, Ed Shee. I'm head of developer relations at a company called Selden. And uh, you know, we're slightly different from Bloomberg and Spotify in that we build machine learning software that we then you know, give to other customers to deploy stuff on. Um, and we do the, like the last mile of machine learning. So we do deployment, monitoring, and explainability side of things, um, but work across all sorts of use cases, which is kind of fun to see. Yeah. Hey, my name's um, Zakashi. I'm an engineer on the ML Plath team at Spotify. I mean, ML is almost everything we do at Spotify. Um, people like teams using ma uh, machine learning for music recommendations and uh, discover new musics. And there's all, all kinds of applications for MIL, um, like ring in so range from small, like um, 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 supervised learning on the type of data sets uh, to very complex deep learning um, on the graphic neural networks. So our team is build, building a centralized ML platform, so allow um, different teams to do different ML ops on our platform. So they can do feature engineering, data validation, model training, and evaluation. And hopefully everything looks good, they can deploy model to production. Uh, my name is Keith Laban. I am the manager of the uh, com compute native, uh, cloud native uh, compute runtimes at Bloomberg. Uh, so uh, just to add on a little bit more to what Yujoy was saying about, about Bloomberg, um, a few, a few years ago, I think I gave a talk, maybe in 2018 or so, about um, building a data science platform using uh, uh, custom resources. Um, and you know, since then, I think we started solving some you know, machine learning uh, focused problems to, to address a lot of the data problems at Bloomberg from natural language to market data. Um, uh, across a diverse set of uh, teams at, at the company. And uh, we ran into a lot of infrastructure-related challenges in building our ML solution. Um, and you know, al along the way, we also realized that the tools that we were building, so we were building you know, training tools, inference tools for you know, going into production, tools for data transformation, so using Spark workflow tools um, to solve you know, machine learning problems, Jupyter notebooks for, for your data exploration. We, we started realizing like actually the tools we're building, yeah, it's, it's useful for machine learning, but it also actually has like a lot of other applications to it. And so um, you know, I, th I think for us like over our journey, um, tr trying to like find the right interface has been like really uh, a challenge because there, there's so many different types of people using our platform. H have you guys found that um, you know, in your machine learning journey? Yeah, I, I think I, actually I'm, I'm going to ask another question to the audience quickly here. So um, can you put your hands up if you are a data scientist 
right? If that's your title, yeah, like one person in the hall, or two. Okay, one, yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of like part of the problem here is that, um, yeah, unsurprisingly, right, we don't have tons of data scientists here at KubeCon. Um, but ultimately, we're kind of building these platforms for data scientists, right? So one of or the ML engineers. Yeah. Who's an ML engineer? Oh yeah, yeah, ML engineers. Okay. What about ML ops engineers? Getting there. Yeah. What about um, ML software data engineers? <laughs> yeah. Everyone has like a different de definition. I think, right? I see a lot of people that like want to raise their hand, but nobody wants to like self associate to that to that skill set. Because I think like a lot of companies, I've, I've seen plenty of these polls uh, this week and I, I see like the same kind of type of engagement. And, and so, you know, as we're building these platforms, at least for us, like we've been trying to define those personas and like what is that interface? Like how abstract is it gonna be? <laughs> I can also talk a little bit, like when we think about interface, we also think about what's the right tool and interface to give. Is this a REST API? Is this a SDK? Is Coop Control the right thing to give to data scientists? Um, and also, we did a lot of like soul searching. What's the user group? Like, of course, primarily for data scientists and the machine learning engineer who want to run large compute workload and surf model. But at the same time, especially for notebook, there are a lot of no engineering use cases as, as well. Like, want to do a report, uh, want to do some data analysis, do some uh, kick off Spark to do some ETL. Um, so that's a that's a that's a something that we have internally discussed a lot. I wonder how the company think about it. Yeah, that's definitely true at Spotify as well. Like the ML problem at Spotify is the problem of long tail. Like all kinds of different ML applications. We have very diverse ML practitioners using ML in very different ways. People need the notebooks, people need the pipelines, people need a reliable way to conduct their um, the ML continuously. So when we design the platform, it's really need to think about layers, like say, um, how about we just can design an API, so can streamline some standardized uh, process, so when easy get on our platform, they can very quickly to build a prototype and build an ML application through a few steps. But if their application really goes deep, really need a lot of customizations. Our platform also need, um, also need to have the flexibility to allow them to like using the low level API to use Kubernetes, to use the computer powers so they can build a very good application. Yeah. About. Yeah, do you, I mean, do you, do you do the same thing at Bloomberg? Do you have like different levels that people can enter the the stack from, right, depending yeah. on what they want to do? Yeah, yeah, that's that's an interesting way of levels, right? Like, so our my org is called the Runtime Team. So we've been really focused on the level of exposing up to sort of the technology layer of the runtime. So if it's Spark, it's how do you run Spark on Kubernetes as good as possible? There might be a number of products that you expose on using Spark because Spark turns out to be really good for reporting uh, functionality and um, and you know analytics tools, but it also happens to be an extremely important project for M or part of the ML lifecycle, the the data engineering, right? And so you might want to have Spark as part of a data science product, you know, platform in one UI, but um, you know, at a sufficiently large company, you probably have plenty of other engineers somewhere else that also want to use Spark for much, much different things. And so, you know, the direction that we've sort of taken is like, how do we build something flexible enough that, you know, other platforms can platform eyes on top of us without having to reinvent the wheel from, from the ground up? So I'm curious, in the audience, who thinks they have too many controls? Too, too much, there's not enough abstraction. No, no hands, okay. <laughs> what about too little abstraction? Who thinks, who thinks the tools that they're using are really hard to use? There's, there's no abstractions at all. Oh, okay. We, 
Is, is there anyone else here? I think I see it. I saw a few hands come up. <laughs> did, I, did I miss any? Um, no, I think, I think we're, it's uh, last session of the day vibes, uh, right? People, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we're trying to keep you awake. We, we do actually have a stooge planted with a mic, by the way. So at any point, if you want to chip into the conversation, please just stick your hand up and, um, and uh, yeah, we, you, can, you can get involved. Um, uh, we actually have a question over there. So yeah, do you want to go over there? Um, while you're doing that, I, I was going to say, yeah, for our like deployment platform we build, um, we tend to see kind of like three types of users. There's like your, I don't know what Kubernetes is and I don't know, need to know what it is type user. And for them, there's like a, you know, lovely UI you can just walk through and drag and drop and kind of, you know, get your model deployed. And then there's like your kind of Python user who's like, just wants to use the SDK and have it deployed again with a few config params. And then there's like your kind of super user who understands Kube, wants to go and you know, play with the container spec and, and do all sorts of things underneath. And we feel we have to account for all of those, right? And actually, the, the more customers use us, the more they end up down in that like super user type thing. Do you find supporting all those types of users is, is a challenge? Yeah, definitely at Spotify, supporting is a big theme in the platform team. Like since we have all kinds of users, they're using all kinds of tools, how do we provide different level of support to enable them, to empower them to build ML application? It's very challenging. Um, our platform team has a user engagement team, so called. They basically gonna bootstrap the ML applications in the future team from zero to one. So they're gonna go out, collaborate with different teams and teach them how to use our tools and to build ML applications. Then um, hopefully the, like, the, en the engineers on the team can learn from those expertise and eventually they're gonna take over the products and um, iterate from there. Yeah, how does yeah. things uh, go That's on interesting, yeah. We, I mean, we don't have a user engagement team, but I, I kind of wish we did. We, we, we put a lot of energy into documentation and internal training, um, and you know, we've been quite successful with it, but again, like, like you said, there's, there's sometimes a, a misstep in, in where the level of abstraction actually is, and, and covering all of those bases sometimes gets really hard, and so I imagine your user engagement team can kind of step in and, and do some you know, solutions engineering with them. Yeah, definitely, I mean, the doc is very important, but doc can only like, cover, um, only can help to a like, certain extent. If like user really need to go lower level, say, hey, how do I build a custom component to do in using a different framework, then you really need people with the expertise to help them to understand the low level library and low level SDK. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd think, right, as a, a software vendor, this bit should be easier. Um, but in, if anything, it's almost harder, right, because, um, you know, being on top of Kubernetes, you have this like wealth of cloud native tooling that you can use all these fantastic CNCF projects that probably all of us around here are using for, for things, you know, all over our organizations. Um, but that, you know, like support and education window suddenly becomes absolutely enormous because, you know, you're using a service mesh, right, as part of your product. And people are then asking you, oh, I have an issue with that. It's conflicting with something else on my cluster. Is that now our job to, to help them with it? And it becomes really difficult, right? All of these kind of things. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a hard one to answer, but we, we try to, what we do is, is try to educate for us like many of the, the common use cases as possible, and then just be really flexible where, where power users need help. I'm kind of cute. I'm curious, like, do you build a specific tool to help the support, to help debugging, those kind of stuff? Um, we don't, no, we don't have like a, a specific tool. Um, I guess, you know, again, one of the great things about being a vendor is at least, you know, we can, we have like a paid support option and people can go through that and then you have dedicated people who can, you know, who have skill sets in all these CNCF tools that we use. Um, but yeah, there's no like, uh, you know, magic, you know, run the, the debug wizard type thing, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely feel the same. 
um, I think one thing we always ask ourselves is that what's the boundary between like user responsibility and infrastructure responsibility? And I think that's always a huge challenge for um, managed infrastructure, um, basically any type of managed infrastructure. Um, and uh, we ask ourselves like, do we provide enough monitoring? Do we have enough metrics, enough logging, like uh, uh, sufficient dashboards so we can offload some of those uh, support, turn it into self-debugging tools and documentations. Um, but then we always found it's never enough because the user base is very different. Like with more in stronger engineering background, like having like CPU metrics, memory metrics, uh, very helpful for those group of users. But for a different group of users, maybe focus more on data science or maybe focus more on data analysis. Like this kind of tool is not like the right tool for them to do self-debugging. No. I think and we have a question now here, yeah. So um, I come from a relatively mature hardware software company and um, we've recently begun doing uh, ML um, on our kinematic data, on our vision data, on our video data. Um, but I guess the question is, how do you establish a culture where management kind of understands the importance of ML ops and DevOps? Because right now our pyramid, you know, is inverted where the data science and analysis comes first and happens on a small scale. But when you try to scale it over your entire fleet around the world, um, as most people here probably know, you run into difficulties. Um, so how do you establish a culture both in management and within the group? Uh, you mentioned documentation is a big thing at Bloomberg. Um, I'm sure that culture didn't come about overnight, and others have mentioned um, other things at your respective companies that have been established. Um, how did you go about establishing them, making that relationship with upper management, C-suite, and kind of having that trickle down to the rest of the company? Before we answer that, could I ask you how you define ML ops? Um, kind of supporting and scaling models, um, supporting and scaling training, um, building tooling for the data scientists, basically all of the things that you guys mentioned um, is how we're defining it, but just like how you said earlier, ML software, data engineer, ML ops, DevOps, um, whatever hat we kind of have to wear there, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I can try to take a step. Um, at Spotify, we have called ML Golden Pass, which kind of like a standard way to do ML, and our platform also build those like standard ML ops, Say if you want to do the like feature processing, uh, we have component for you. Say if you want to do the data validation, then there's component for you. And our platform also requires some um, like standardization of the feature schema and evaluation metrics. So trying to standardize the whole ML workflow into a sequence of components. Then when user run those workflow, when user finished prototyping and move the workflow to production, they can follow those steps and the deploy model to production. Yeah, I think, um, uh, like, actually I was going to talk about, uh, like, um, a standard we use, uh, you mentioned, you know, kind of having those standards are really important. Um, something we use is, is called, like, the, the V2 inference protocol or open inference protocol or whatever. I know that Bloomberg uses it as well, right? And that um, despite using a different deployment engine underneath, right? And that's something that's really cool because it means like, um, you know, it, if I want to interact with a machine learning model, you know, that's been deployed on Selden, right? It's the same interface that I'm using as if I'm, you know, I suddenly start interacting with Bloomberg's models, right? And so standardizing those things makes it not just user easier for the the people who have to deploy these things, but actually for people who have to work with it as well, you know, the software engineers and the application owners who are integrating with those APIs as well. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of thing definitely helps. Yeah. Well, I, think, I, so, um, I can mention one more thing I, th I feel uh, helpful to establish a like, culture between... Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, this, I would like to mention that uh, one thing that we are, like within Bloomberg, we are trying to uh, establish more, streamline more for our data science platform is that to define our uh, escalation process better. Like we, we support like uh, like over a thousand, uh, we have more than 1,000 people just in our support chat and we have 100 teams onboarded into the uh, platform. So 
uh, to define a way to escalate issues so we can prioritize better from our side and really address uh, the highest priority issue and also uh, streamline the process that give us enough information to shorten the overall uh, investigation time. That's also something that I found super helpful. Yeah, I think a lot of it, you know, documentation, golden paths, all that stuff is, is really great and, and, and something we think about as, as well. But like you, Joy said, like really providing transparency to, you know, your upper management, senior management, and to all the work you're actually doing is extremely hard, right? And finding ways to, to do that, like there's not one answer to how to do that. Um, and then I don't, I don't know where you are in your, in your journey towards this, whatever you want to call it, but there's also kind of the subtext of just like cloud native mentality in your company. So if you're in a fairly mature company, just, you know, shifting to cloud native before you even introduce that ML stuff to the conversation is potentially a, a challenge too. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a mixture between grassroots and, you know, finding people that can advocate for you and are really good at talking to C-level people, so. Cool, we have a yeah, question here. Yeah, I had a question. Oh, so our, comp our company does um, machine learning platform for PhD researchers. Uh, one thing we have trouble with is when we upgrade some of the components, we wanna make sure um, we don't break the code for the, I guess, the users. Um, my question was uh, two things. First, uh, how do you communicate what will break? Um, and then how do you test and make sure whatever you're doing wouldn't break um, the, or interrupt the machine learning side of things or um, whoever's using the infrastructure? So whether it's a CUDA upgrade or any of the smaller components. Cool, I, I mean, I, I can take a stab at this while you guys think about it. Um, so from, from our perspective, we're about to go through this actually. So we have a, um, like a, a major release of our platform that's coming that's um, gonna allow people to, uh, when they create their like custom Python models, um, it's, it's gonna be slightly different. Right now, I won't go into the details, but the, uh, the important thing about this is that the first thing is we plan to support the previous way of doing it for a long period of time. I think that's really important because um, even if there are tons of benefits to doing something a new way, right? The fact that you've broken the way they did stuff, you have to give them time, um, and then provide like as much education as we can. Firstly, like why they should move to the newer method, um, but also to make it as easy as possible. And that's, you know, the great thing is that's literally my role at the company. So, uh, you know, it's to create videos and tutorials and blogs and things like that to, to make it as easy as possible. So it's like, okay, you're upgrading from this version to this version. Your custom Python model is gonna change a little bit. This is exactly what you need to do. Don't worry too much, et cetera. Um, yeah. I think setting expectations is just, is so important. And I think that's something the Kubernetes community, I think as, as a whole has done a really good job of in terms of labeling things as alpha, beta, and so on. And, and they're, they're really clear about what that actually means in terms of interfaces, stability, things like that. And so kind of following those guidelines as a whole, like you, you want to pass some of that through to your user base internally. And then, you know, you know we set our SLAs and, and stuff like that on our own internal offerings of our stuff and kind of plan out our fail failure domains carefully so that we can roll out upgrades um, in a way where, where we know we're not going to take out everyone all at once and we can try to triage the issues as they come in before you know, taking out too much. Yeah, for us, I guess, um, communication and the collaboration are the keys. Um, like, wherever we do the big upgrades, we let the user know, like, um, a month ahead, just tell them you need to expect breaking changes. And then we also put a lot of effort to write in the migration doc so user can follow step by step to update their pipeline and their workflows. And we also have the um, called migration force. Basically, we want to help them to migrate their pipeline to a certain degree. We had a question, question here. So I'm uh, curious what your experience has been uh, at your various companies with maturing 
and you know, machine learning organization into something that's sane and operational. Uh, you know, at, at our company, we, you know, AI ML is a relatively new thing. I know a lot of companies that's been around for ages and they already know how to do it, but for us, we've like acquired companies that, you know, have a you know, AI component. And so you have a bunch of, you know, data scientists that have systems that they built themselves, their pets, they don't want to let go of them. They don't understand. You know, they don't want to play with anyone else. They don't want to hand this over to IT or to a DevOps or a SRE organization. And so, um, you know, you mentioned things like golden paths and stuff as a way of kind of building that culture. But um, do you have any like war stories or just advice for how does an you know an IT or an infrastructure organization um, interact with teams like that to help bring them on board? a very good question. <laughs> so I would say, especially in a large company, uh, I found it's hard to have one solution to fit, fit all. So I definitely see there are teams want to build some their own infrastructure or maybe part of it and then run another part of it in over platform. So uh, I, think that's, I think that's actually common because I believe there's no one solution fit all. But I think as some features mature, like, and we found out, oh, there are like multiple teams need that feature, uh, and eventually this kind of feature will uh, merge into a uh, like more mature platform. As it matures, I think that's a, like a great way to put it. Like the problem, I think, gets better over time if you find the right set of users in the beginning in the company that are going to be strong advocates for the platform you're building. Eventually, you know you you might get some of the rest of that market share and you might not. Um, it was definitely kind of a big challenge when we first started. Everyone had their own, you know, metal, whatever, uh, big iron machines, GPUs, whatever, that they can do whatever they wanted on. And then when it broke and there was no one there to fix it, they realized, oh, wait, I'm not, you know, doing data science. I'm not doing this ML research anymore. I'm actually now an SRE for some machine. And so once that sort of resourcing dried up for, for those types of people. And there is more messaging towards, hey, you know, there is another platform that you can use where you don't have to think about these types of issues anymore. Then, then you know, you start, start picking up some of those, that market share. But, but it definitely takes, you know, a long time to build a mature system where people actually have that faith um, that, that they can move over to it. Yeah, definitely. We also can off, like, uh, rely on the open source tooling, the new technology. For example, Spotify is investing in Ray, um, like generic uh, distributed um, processing system for ML and to complement the opinionated ML workflow we have for the um, production systems. So which means ML researchers and data scientists, they can access more broad ML ecosystems to use more libraries and doing the experiments on Ray, which that's another uh, um, another aspect, just offering like more flexible online platform, so people can do more things on uh, like by themselves. I think we had a, a question over here, so I don't know where the mic's gone. Uh, yeah, over here. Hello. Um, so given most of us probably in the room are platform engineers where we may have varying levels of understanding of the needs of ML engineers, data scientists, et cetera. Well, to be frank for me, it's very little. <laughs> I guess my question is, where should someone like ourselves get started in terms of best helping to understand the needs of the, uh, for data scientists and ML engineers uh, from a conceptual basis, like whether that's like the technical needs or the infra expertise, like where would you, like, you know, j just asking for general directional guidance from that perspective, as, especially from the perspective of someone who doesn't really know th those things overly well. Um, I, that's, a, that's a tough question, right? Because I think it, um, it slightly depends on your size of organization. I think if you're a, a, a small company where you're, you know, one of the only platform engineers and you just have to support these ML workloads, you might have to be a bit of a, a hero, right? And and learn some of this stuff yourself, and um, you know, and work closely with your data scientists, ML engineers, whatever you're calling them, right? Um, 
if that's the case, right, the, you know, there's now, the good thing is that like tons of online communities around ML, ML ops, ML engineering, you know, there's loads of resources and people who can share best practices and experiences. Because I think we're, you know, in this ML ops world, right, whatever that means, we're kind of, you know, where DevOps was 10, 15 years ago. Um, and obviously it's accelerated way qu more quickly because we can just reuse all the best practices from DevOps. But there are still a ton of things that are different. You know, like if you're a, a, a DevOps engineer, you, you w won't have heard of drift detection or why you need to do that in a machine learning model. Um, uh, and that's where I was gonna say, so if you're a bigger organization, I think you can probably hire like people to do ML ops engineering or, or p machine learning engineers who are kind of closer to the infrastructure side and can understand both sides of the fence and then they can they can kind of bridge the gap between two teams. Um, so you, you're kind of, it's probably one of those two approaches, I'd say. I don't know if uh, any of you want to add anything on that. Well, I was going to go back to something you said earlier, actually, about kind of the CNCF landscape as a whole. You were kind of hinting towards that. And, you know, that's just a great resource to begin with, right? Like, there's so many platforms, like I'm sure you're all here going to all the talks of, you know, Metaflow and Kubeflow and all the different flows, right? And then there is all the SaaS providers as well. And so there, there's tons of solutions that you can look at that, you know, provide some out of the box, um, you know, functionality that, you know, maybe you don't actually need to solve all of those problems yourself. And you can focus more on the, you know, ML, you know, engineering side of it, right? The more of the, on the research side and, and you don't need to hire those, those other, um, you know, types of people. Um, on the other hand, at Bloomberg, you know, we're all we're all on prem. We have really sensitive data, so we don't. We're and we're a larger organization, so we tend to build, you know, a lot of it ourselves. But that also takes a lot of, you know, time and energy and and investments. Yeah, for Spotify, we run everything on, on Google Cloud, so we get like a lot of benefits. We bootstrap our ML platform. Right on TensorFlow extended, it's like um, component-based approach. Define like define standard ML ops through the component, so you can run the entire um, ML pipelines on Kubernetes. Um, that helps a lot to like ensure user can um, like and design workflow. Then make sure the workflow has everything you need to de develop a successful ML application. Great. We uh, have another question, I think. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I wanted to go back to something you're talking about earlier with debugging, um, specifically about what we expect people to know about Kubernetes. So um, it seems like we want to have a lot of abstractions and maybe a data scientist, maybe we don't, maybe they don't need to know what a pod is even, right, at some point. Um, but on the same hand, we've been thinking a lot about debugging and how to expose that to the data scientist to better understand their system. And sometimes the errors look like uh, a proxy couldn't connect to the pod because the pod's been umkilled. So they need to understand what a proxy is or maybe their vision's not ready. Uh, so what's a replica set? These things kind of end up leaking into um, the errors that we expose to them. So my question is maybe specifically, what do you guys expect data scientists at this point to know and about Kubernetes details? And if so, how, or how does that leak into your debugging platform and the errors that you show um, and expose to them? Uh, I, I mean, yes, no, no one else wanted to go first, so I'll, I'll try. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, that's a really hard one. Um, so for, for our platform, yeah, we talk a lot about like error surfacing and, and where, you know, what's the right level to, to bring up to the person. And I think it kind of ties back to the personas we talked about earlier of like, you know, are they that, if they're that um, don't need any Kubernetes knowledge, kind of self-service, you know, want to just deploy a model and don't really care how it runs type person, um, we, need to, we need to have a way to just surface that there is an error and if it's something that's like, oh, your, you know, your model was, I don't know, like the wrong, you selected the wrong model type, right? You gave us a TensorFlow model and it was PyTorch, right? That's something we can easily like tell them. If it's something much lower level, we probably need to tell them there's an error, but then have a way to, to have that surface to the right person who's like the platform owner or, you know, the, the team lead who runs that 
um, those deployments. That's and so that's the kind of challenge we have there. And I think you have to think about it in that and from those personas and see, you know, what's the right level of error to surface to them, and if not, can we, you know, send it off to someone else? Um, yeah, I don't know what 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 you guys do there, or you just give them all the logs. Well, we try. We try to abstract them. Um, and, and thanks, Alexa, by the way. It's Alexa. She has a great podcast called Alexa's Input. If you don't know her, <laughs> check it out. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we try. We try to set up these abstractions, right? Like, that's, that's why we are talking about personas and, you know, building the right product for the right people. Um, but you forget something, and then some pot, some log kind of leaks through, and and you know, trying to figure out what that expectation is, and like, do we have the time to radically change our assumptions of how we've built the product to fix that specific type of error message in a way that has some clear remediation for an end user? And you know, the truth is, like, all these tools are built on, you know, an extremely complicated stack, and you hinted at this earlier. Right, like, are you using a service mesh? Are you using Istio, Linkerd, or you know, are you using, you know, KServe, which also brings in Knative into your stack, right? And so there, there are just like a lot of, uh, you know, tools in the middle uh, to to provide, you know, to an end user what's a fa fairly trivial thing. Like, I just want to deploy my model, but it turns out there's a whole lot of infrastructure that has to go behind that. Um, and so, you know, a little bit I think is setting expectations, and so that's where like ML ops comes into the equation. You know, do you have people sitting with the ML engineers who are productionizing the models that can speak the language of Kubernetes a little bit better, or you know, is that on the on the runtimes? Is that on the platform team to completely abstract all of that stuff away? And, and it's a real, I think it's a really hard question um, to answer. Okay, I think we're nearly out of time. Should we do one final question here? Um, and then we'll wrap up after this one, yeah. Um, I was wondering how you deal with uh, multi-tenancy issues, because as a platform engineer, it feels like we have plenty of tools to deal with multiple teams of developers in one big cluster. But once we get into the ML space, we're just basically handing out large chunks of hardware to different applications, and we don't really know what's going on in there and how to add value from a platform perspective. Um, I can, pr so we actually use Kubernetes like namespace for user isolation. Uh, we, we choose to build over a uh, cluster in a multi-tenancy way. Uh, that's, a, that's a very important underlying infrastructure we have. Um, and we isolate, isolate different users like uh, credentials, identities, uh, like resource quota, this kind of thing. Uh, and allow them to basically uh, own a share of our clusters and run the kick off the workload. Um, I believe Spotify also has multi-tenancy infrastructure. Yes, we did a similar way. Every team, they have their own namespace. Then the way it works, uh, we have our own controller, like team um, submit config file, define like what kind of service comes you use. Uh, what's the owner of the namespace, like our controller can automatically set up those permissions for them and make sure all the parts running on that namespace has access to data, has access to the GCP service running on different user projects. Cool. Yeah, um, we, we do a little bit of both actually. We have like namespaces and then we also have an abstraction called projects over the top, which allow people to, you know, things like models registered in a catalog to be shared between teams and things without them necessarily having to have access to the same namespace as someone else, and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we're pretty much out of time, but before we go, should we, I'm gonna put everyone on the spot here and ask you all to, to, to give like one piece of advice to everyone in the room. And I'll go first so you get a bit of thinking time. Um, I'm actually gonna go back to the question someone asked earlier about um, you know, how to learn the right resources uh, you know, for machine learning if you're coming from the you know, Cube platform engineer side. Um, and I'd say just try as best as you can, if you're interested in this space, learn both, right? Because whilst it's a hell of a lot to learn, you'll never learn everything. Um, it's a you know, massively growing field. And uh, if nothing else, you'll make yourself incredibly employable because people are always looking for people who have skills on both sides. So that's, that's my one hot tip. I don't know if you have one. Yeah, I will definitely suggest to 
embrace the community. So I started to work on ML infrastructure about three years ago, and I have no idea what Kubernetes is. <laughs> and uh, so throughout the past three years, um, being involved in open source uh, community, being a contributor, or sometimes just contrib sometimes even just contribute very small thing, pick up a small GitHub issue, have a discussion, um, just learn a lot. And uh, along the way, I get to know many, many brilliant people that I just, I feel like I know the smartest brain in the whole world and absorb their knowledge. And uh, that's what get myself, uh, and I guess also my team so far to provide a data science platform. Yeah, I will probably, um, if you want to build an ML platform, I really like the design pattern called like progressive complexity exposure. So you need to offer some like streamlined uh, process like an ML golden pass, allow people to quickly start the ML workflow. Then if they have more needs, they can uh, like dive into the details, look at the low level APIs, low level docs to really customize their applications. I'll give a, uh, what did you say, tip? Advice. It can be. A, it doesn't. It could be my a, own, like my own don't use this tool. A, as a, as an infrastructure provider. I guess be really intentional about what you're building and set expectations for for your users, um, especially in the ML space. I think in the early days of our of our building our platform, it's it's extremely easy to spread yourself too thin because the amount of things that you need to build just to get a small ML project off the ground is is basically like go to the solution center. It's like something from everyone, um, and and you know I would I would really advise you to think hard about what you're actually going to support <laughs> in the future uh, if you if you deliver that. So so be really intentional about how you approach that problem. Great. All right. Well, um, yeah. Th thank you all for for coming, and we'll be around if you have any other questions you wanted to chat to about afterwards. Thank you very much.